My interest is in archaeology and ancient native peoples of North America, and particularly the Midwest. I started out in Ohio in the early 1970s, where I did uh, undergraduate work, came to UW-Madison in the mid-1970s, where I did graduate work, worked in Grant and Crawford County, and, and became a specialist in what people were eating, particularly what animals they were eating at archaeological sites. I analyze animal bones and shells. I can do freshwater mussels. I've done a huge numbers of freshwater mussels from archaeological sites. I have done huge numbers of animal bones. We can get the kind of animals that were hunted, the abundance of those animals, how much they provided in food, uh, what the habitat was like in the region, and coupled with that, because of a certain professor, I became interested in land snails, used as proxies to tell us what ancient environments were like. So you have an archaeological site such as a bison kill in the west, and you don't have any pollen because it's calcareous soil, but you have lots of snails. So what do the snails? Snails are like other uh, animals. They're to specific environments, and once you know those environments, you can kind of put a, if you will, a thumbprint, uh, a signature on what that environment was like. So I'm very interested in the environment, snails, and out of that, uh, believe it or not, I do land surveys for snails, land snail surveys in Wisconsin. Done a couple for the DNR. I've done a number in the West. Uh, and so if you need to know something about the land snails, let me know. And interestingly, in the mid-1980s, I surveyed bluff prairies from Grant County all the way to Pepin County. And there's a published paper on it in a journal called The Nautilus and some time ago, maybe in 1990 or so, so it's been a long time. But I've been interested in bluff prairies for a long time. I've been interested in how native peoples lived on this landscape right here in ancient times. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk in three phases. I'm going to give you a quick lesson or comments is a better term on, on, on the environment to some degree and my appreciation for it. Um, secondly, a little bit about archaeology and what we know about our past and now hone in on some specific areas and particularly in this driftless area. So it's a variety of things I'm going to go through. I hope you can see the slides. I know the screen's small, and maybe I have too many slides on, on here. So let me go ahead and, and start with that. Uh, our, our effigy mounds are known by everybody. I'm going to come back to effigy mounds a number of times. Effigy mounds are important. They are burial places for native peoples who lived here about A.D. 700 to A.D. 1050, roughly 1,000 years ago to 1,300 years ago. That's when all the FG mounds are built. After about A.D. 1050, these people disappear from the landscape. And I want to address that question tonight. Why did they disappear? What happened to them? Because it relates to the landscape they lived in. The landscape they lived in was a savanna landscape by and large. Uh, don't have to spend a lot of time on this. But I did want to talk about the shifts in climate. And, you know, Darcy Kine on, a, on the first uh, video talked about uh, the origins of bluff prairies. And this is a period of time from 14,000 years ago to the present. This is about temperature and precipitation. And this was done by Dr. Reed Bryson, a climatologist at UW-Madison based on a huge database. But this is specifically for... Uh, uh, the lacrosse area, but it applies here. And this, this actually goes, this is model precipitation, and this is winter and summer precipitation. This is January to green to summer. So at the end of the last ice age, you have lots of precipitation, and by the time you get about 8,000 years ago, the precipitation reduced, is reduced. At the same time, the precipitation is reduced, we end up with warmer July temperatures. And this resulted in what we know as a spread of prairies to the east. It's called sometimes the Prairie Peninsula. And you can see it right here. This is uh, short grass, tall grass, and you finally get into to mixed savanna here. This is sometimes it goes into Illinois, 
spots in Ohio. You don't have any vertebrates in Ohio, but you have the plants, prairie plants coming in, some remnant areas. And you can kind of see that here. Here's a mixed area. Uh, vegetation, even if we look at the 1830s and the 1980s, uh, this is looking at Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. And this is a painting by George Catlin. Perhaps you can't see it, particularly if you're in the back. But he shows virtually no vegetation on these landscapes. If we look at the GLOs, the Government Land Office surveys for the 18, depending on where you are, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, where we live in rural Vernon County, they surveyed it during the, the winter of 1844-45. And it was Oak Savannah and tall grass prairie on the uplands, on the high uplands, white oak and bur oak is almost the only trees. Not enough trees, they have witness trees, they built rock piles to, to mark corners and to mark positions. The paintings by Catlin have it right. This is looking at Prairie du Chien, this is modern. Virtually no vegetation on these exposed prairies. Uh, again, Catlin, famous landmarks in the upper Mississippi River, Seth Eastman. Uh, I think this is Maiden, Maiden Bluff, is it not? Somebody help me out with landscape. But virtually no vegetation on here. And we know why that was, because there were perpetual fires. The prairie spread to the east due to a warm climatic phase we often call the altothermal. Warm, dry westerlies pushed east, brought us the prairie plants. And after about 5,000 years ago, it started getting moist again. The native peoples were here in some numbers. And those native peoples burned these prairies, or let these prairies burn persistently. People like John Curtis, you read the vegetation of Wisconsin, he, he's, he has very little doubt that native peoples are responsible for maintaining a prairie savanna landscape by, by burning. And there are a number of good reasons for that. Uh, we end up with oak savannas. We know these are treasured remnants that we have, tall grasses and bur oaks and white oaks predominantly. Uh, hard for you to see these maps, but what we're looking at here is the southern one half of Wisconsin. And if we look at this map in detail, lots of this is oak savanna. There are some other things in here, of course. Uh, there's uh, the, the east of the Kickapoo River, we have a fire shadow. So we do have some woodlands there, largely developed after AD 1300, however. And uh, uh, largely this is an area of Oak Savannah. Native peoples have been in Wisconsin and been involved with this ever-shifting environment, ever-shifting uh, 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 climatic patterns for at least 13,000 years. First people that come into the area about 13,000 years ago, we know they're involved in hunting in large ice age animals, mammoths, mastodons. Uh, we refer to these as Pleistocene, I mean ice age, Pleistocene megafauna. Bigger than these guys up here. And uh, uh, these are bachelor Norwegian brothers. What else would you have? And they have the, the lower arm bone. This is John and Otto Swinnis, really. Bachelor Norwegian Brothers. Nicest people in the world. And they found this bone in their creek. And they asked me to take a look at it. And it is an ulna, a lower leg bone of a, of a mastodon. So it would be right down here. They literally took this bone, this part of the bone. See how large it is. Took it to their vet and said, what do you think this is? And the vet says, I had some kind of horse bone. And they asked me, I said, get a new vet. <laughs> uh, these large animals were hunted with specialized spear points called fluted points or clovis points. Here's a group of them from near Tripolo, Wisconsin. And they're all made out of a special chert called Cochrane chert right down the road here. Ch Cochrane chert. It's beautiful, red and yellow, when it's cooked, when it's heated, and it flakes beautifully. And these are very specialized spear points with these grooves in them, never made again. Only found at this time around 13,000 to 12,000 years ago. In many places, they've been found associated with mammoth and mastodons, where these animals were killed. 
This is the Boaz mastodon, which is really a composite of the two different mastodons. They kept this a secret for a long time. And, uh, but this is near the town of Boaz in Richland County, and this was apparently a kill site at this location for these early peoples here. Uh, this is a site in, in uh, Sauk County called Natural Bridge State Park, and archaeologists call this rock shelter the Raditz Rock Shelter after original landowners here. And this, this site, these are great sites, these rock shelters. And you can peel them like an onion and go down. And as you go down, it gets older and older and older. And we see the changes in what was being used, utilized for food, what kind of tools they were making over time. And so we did this shelter and the number like it were excavated in the uh, 1950s. And they really set up the, the basic framework we have for archaeology. And since that time, we've been refining it, dating it, and refining it, trying to understand how people lived in the past. Uh, we can tell by different shapes of projectile points, arrow points, and spear points, the age of them very approximately. So any good archaeologist in the region would tell you that these are about 5,000 years old, and these are about 2,000 years old, and these are about 1,000 years old. These are spear points of a variety of kinds, and these are arrow points. Arrow, bow and arrow comes in pretty late in this part of the world, and before that, there are, 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 are these that are propelled by what are called spear throwers or atlatl specialized tools to project, uh, uh, to project a projectile very, very rapidly and efficiently. We also use pottery, ceramic containers, to date these sites. These are dated indirectly by use of radiocarbon dating, which works quite well. And we can take our artifacts and we can get the age for these and, and if you will, develop a chronology or a time sequence for things that happened in the past and what people were doing, what they were eating. Our effigy mounds, again, are, are something that we're, we want to talk about in some detail. And uh, I think I'll, I'll come back to these in a minute. Our primary food source for native peoples for the last 7,000 years from 7,000, let's go from 7,000 to 1,000 years ago. The primary food source you're looking at is white-tailed deer. These are what was hunted in large parts. Uh, we find these in rock shelters. Sometimes we find tens of thousands of deer bones. And these are laid down over many centuries of repeated occupation. We know that people harvest these largely in the, in the late fall, early winter period. September, October, November are the big kill months. We can take the deer jaws, uh, which we have fragmented here, and these all have erupting dentition, erupting teeth, and we can age these within about a month or two months of when they're killed. When we get a large sample from layers in these sites, we can tell when these sites were occupied. So we know these rock shelters, largely found in the interior, up our coolies, up our drainages, were occupied in the fall and winter. Big harvest, probably making a sausage-like product called pemmican. Men are out hunting deer. Women are processing meat, drying it, probably mixing it with fat and other things to make a sausage-like product on the plains they called pemmican. So you can live on that all winter. The trap, early trappers and hunters did. They knew who made the best pemmican with the least deer hair in it. So, but we, we know a great deal. Uh, in the summer, we know that people were uh, uh, on the river fishing, collecting freshwater mussels. We've excavated large numbers of these sites in the Prairie du Chien area and the La Crosse area. And we have shellmans with, with sometimes with hundreds of thousands of freshwater mussel shells mixed with artifacts, fish bones, a few deer in the summer, but mostly uh, aquatic organisms are being harvested. Summer is a great time because the living's easy in Wisconsin in the summer. In the winter, it can be a really, really a stressful situation. Varieties of plants were harvested. There was a little bit, a little bit of gardening done uh, 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. There was no agriculture per se, the last six or seven hundred years, there was no horticulture 
with domestic plants that you would recognize, such as corn, until about a thousand years ago. So agriculture comes in very late. Uh, horticulture comes in pretty late. And for most of the time, people live by hunting and gathering wild resources. Uh, we have a pattern in western Wisconsin. And that pattern is summer towards large bodies of water, winter dispersed into the interior. And during the winter, people broke into, we think, small groups, 15, 20, 30 people, five, six related families, move for the winter, go into a valley, go into a coulee, harvest deer systematically during the rut, probably mostly. And then in the summer, you drain out of these coolies and you come to places like Prairie du Chien, the big terraces, Trempolo perhaps, other places in the interior of West of, of southern Wisconsin, it'd be around Lake Mendota, around the Four Lakes at Madison, and you have big summer camps there. All these small groups that spent the winter together, frictions develop, difficulties develop, you're part of a bigger organization, you can come together during the summer, you can reorganize. This family will go over and live with another family and split up for the year. Also, these summer aggregates allow you to found a spouse. If you're a maritable age, you're probably too closely related to the people you spent the winter with to have somebody you can marry. Every group has incest taboos. You also have problems with your father-in-law, probably, or your uncle or somebody, and you really need to get, have a way to relieve those frictions, and it's at these summer camps when you bury the dead. The dead are curated. They're not buried generally at these rock shelter sites. They are curated and brought in as bundles of bones. And we find these in, in mounds and other kind of mortuary or burial settings where they're bundles of bones that are from winter people who, who passed on. So everybody can pay their last respects. And then in the, in the fall of the year, or late, late summer, you break up and you go into a different coolie for the winter probably. People are spread out in the low density populations. Best estimate we have at the height of effigy mound times for how many people were in the southern half of Wisconsin? 3,000 people. And I could break that down several ways, but the population density is pretty low. I lived in simple structures. They didn't make permanent houses because they moved across the landscape. They had a summer-winter pattern. This is historic. What they have is simple pole structures with cattail uh, mats. This is what we think uh, they were doing in prehistory, by and large. Some corn horticulture, very light, starts about 8,900. You don't grow corn if you can get deer in abundance. Get it enough. It's hard work. Got to protect it from the critters. The yields are nothing like today. 10, 12, 15 bushels an acre in native corn plots. So it's a tough road to hoe when you're only growing one acre of corn and you're only getting a few bushels and you gotta protect it from blackbirds and raccoons and what have you. Well, I wanna to turn to some specific things about prairies, prairie areas. This is the area where I live in the North Fork of the Bad Axe River. And uh, this is looking down river and this is looking up river, different seasons. But I wanna point out a few things. I think there's probably by the best estimation, 90% more wood today than there was in most of prehistory in this valley, at least the last 8,000 years. Looking at the government land office surveys and looking at the soils, uh, looking at a number of things that we're well wooded today. Europeans hate fire. Native Europeans who came in here to farm didn't like fire. Their buildings are wood, their crops can burn, their corn can burn when it's dry. Uh, first thing they do is they have roads, stop the fire, uh, the fire succession was almost immediate. Native peoples had a very different view of this, we believe. Our best estimation is these valleys, uh, many of which, and this is the area we're looking at here where, where we're from, uh, yeah, run up generally uh, east to west. And so those west winds come up here and those prairie fires, tall grass prairie, could burn up these valleys burn up these faces. Of course, you have fire shadows on the east, you have rock faces, you have some wood. But it's largely a savanna and prairie landscape. This is a, uh, not a great picture, and it's an old one, of one of our burns in a, in, a, in a planted prairie field. 
But we've had, we've had, we only have eight acres that we've planted in prairie. And in those eight acres, when it's, now it's really mature, we really get the grass that's eight, nine feet high, high big blue stem and that. Well, when we've burned it, we've had uh, Mississippi Valley crews out there scared the hell out of us. So hot, so fast, that if you were camping in that, or got caught in it, you'd be a goner. And I think Native peoples knew that. And I think Native peoples encouraged these fires to let them go up these valleys and burn them out, because then you're good for the, for the warm season. You can go in there. You don't have to worry about the fire coming. We've already accounts of people watching these, these tremendous prairie gra fires on tall grass prairies. So, so it is something I think Native peoples did. And also in the Savannah landscape, which we're going to talk about a little more, is that white-tailed deer are not nearly as abundant as they are today in these prairie landscapes. We have 10 or 15 or 20 white-tailed deer per square mile. Well, I'm in prairies, as you go west, how many, what's the deer population? What's the white-tailed deer population do? Drops, it drops way down. And we think that maybe five or six or seven deer per square mile would be a very high number of white-tailed deer. And for people who primarily live by white-tailed deer, that's important. Secondly, what do you burn in the winter? in a savanna. Well, fir oaks and white oaks are natural pruners, so you can pick up the firewood. Might get a little driftwood here and there in these interior valleys. There isn't a hell of a lot of wood out there. And it's interesting, unlike the east where I began working in Ohio, where you get lots of stone axes, we don't get very many here. You get almost none. So people are not chopping trees, they're not ringing trees as far as we can tell. They're not doing much for firewood except what they can find on the ground. And that means you have to cover a lot of space, not only for deer, but for firewood. Big problem in the winter. They didn't go south. So we're in this area here, uh, and uh, we'll go on. Uh, did a lot of excavation over the years, starting in the 70s all the way into the, the 2000s in, in western Wisconsin. And this is just out, out in our area. Uh, just to show you a few excavations, this was a winter house, two excavations. And when it gets 20 below, what do you do? You basically dig out a, 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 a subterranean house, cover it loosely, and you bring hot rocks in. You can't have a fire in there. So this was a hearth that's right here, dug on different ears. So it had 600 pounds of rock in it. Covered underneath, but laid on top of a bed of oak charcoal. You have charcoal identified. It's oak, white oak, probably. And we excavated half of it, and it's 300 pounds. So I think there are 600 pounds. But I think these houses were all around this hearth, and literally then you bring in hot rocks and keep warm. We got carbon dates on this and artifact dates. Dates right about uh, uh, late in the effigy mountain times. 8950, AD 1000. So this is how people were living in the winter, hard to keep warm. I uh, wanted to show you some soils at this same area. And you see this young lady is drawing a profile from an excavation. And you can see our buried prairie soils here. You see gopher runs. And we find remains of Plains Pocket Gophers. They have very distinct dentition. And it was full of them. There are Plains Pocket Gophers all over this area in prehistory in these prairie soils. Now let me show you these. This is in the same area. And the students hated me for this because I had them digging holes and weren't finding much archaeology. But we sure had some neat soil profiles. This is new soil. This is what we call PSA, post-settlement alluvium, post-European settlement alluvium. And this covers almost all of these valleys. And when you go in there with a probe, I can show you a lot of pictures from down in the, going down in the river, down in the North Fork of the Bad Axe. But these black prairie soils are buried. These are historic soils. These are prairie soils. You can see here what it looks like. And I actually had soil scientists come out and they couldn't believe it. So we didn't know it was down there. We thought it was all new soil. Lots of prairie soil in these rare areas. And again, we're in a prairie landscape that's hard to see, hard to get to. Well, archaeology. Don't worry about the details of this map. This map shows two different groups 
And these have been very well defined. This is down in my area. This is a phase of archaeology. Uh, we, we, we give names to phases of native peoples in the past based on the pottery and artifacts. And this is the Eastman phase. And they have lots and lots of effigy mounds. Up where you guys are at the same time is the Lewis phase. And they have different kinds of effigy mounds and different kinds of projectile points. And in, in these areas, we have literally a no man's land in, in Coon Creek, modern day Coon Creek. If you go down, go down into uh, 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 Vernon County and you'll see Coon Creek. You'll pass Coon Creek near Stoddard, Wisconsin. And that, that's the dividing line. That's the dividing line. That was the no man's land right between there. And we've done a lot of work and it seems like this is the case, is that with effigy mound peoples about A.D. 750, bow and arrows are pretty new. Bow and arrow comes in about 600 or 650. And then it develops. And effigy mound people become very sophisticated with bow and arrows. They became more and more numerous in their population. They're all over the place. By 8,900 effigy mound people uh, just saturate the area. And we think there's a lot of competition for land and real estate. And what we call this, the archaeologists call this, they say the land became packed. Packed with people given the large resource base that was available. There's not enough deer for this many people who are efficient bow and arrow hunters. And it seems like effigy mounds were initially just built on the Mississippi River and really started out as cone-shaped or conical mounds, developed into these effigy mounds. Effigy mounds probably represent a clan symbol. So if you're born into the bear clan, if you're born into or buried into a mound, it's the shape of a bear. If you're an eagle clan or a thunderbird clan, be in a bird mound. Clans tell you a lot of things, tell you who you can and can't marry to begin with, because if you're a bear clan, you're never going to marry a bear clan person. Then says, also he has responsibilities. Who's responsible for burying the dead? Who's responsible for certain things uh, ceremonially and so forth and so on? So we, we have these effigy mound people, and we see them change over their 400-year history. From pure hunters and gatherers to about 8,900, they start picking up some corn agriculture. And they build more and more mounds in the interior of the Cooley region. And these mounds not only bury the dead, but they're meant to be seen. They're meant to tell you something. No trespassing on this land for strategic resources, such as white-tailed deer. North Fork of the Bad Axe, we think there are perhaps would support 20 people to 30 people total in 80 square miles of drainage. So I published, myself and a colleague have published papers on this in the national journals, and it seems to be the case that efficiency in hunting and increased population reduced the deer population to such a degree that it caused great stress in the population. And effigy mounds are simply not built in western Wisconsin after AD 1050 from everything we can tell. And the area is abandoned for about 100 years. White-tailed deer, vulnerable and bad winters with deep snow. And we know we've had that in western Wisconsin. In the 1850s, they removed almost all the white-tailed deer in this region. They had snows that were several feet deep. Early settlers who'd only been here a few years, they went out with axes and whacked the deer. And then, you know what? There were no deer for quite some time. Population was greatly, greatly reduced. We think in prehistory this happened too. Maybe over and over and over because we see peaks in population and just nobody's there. Peaks in population, nobody there. We have a cave in, uh, near the town of Soldiers Grove, Crawford County. This is the entrance to that cave. And if you crawl back in there, a little far below, far back from where there's any light, you go into the big chamber and there's drawings on the, on the wall. This is an actual drawing. This is an artist's reconstruction. And it shows bow and arrow hunters. There's one there. There's one there. There's one there. One there. Shooting white-tailed deer. They got their tail up. Elk, they have a little tiny tail. 
holding their tail up, alert signal, and they got babies in them. You can see the little fawns inside, drawn inside the deer. What, what's this about? They, native people didn't generally do this. To do that is to destroy the next year's crop. But if the deer population got to such a low ebb that you depend on that for your primary protein, clothing for deer hides, and the deer are low density, unlike today, fed on soybeans and corn, and you have a bad winter, and your family's hungry, you go kill those deer, and you know where they're at down in the swamp. And then what do you do the next year? What are you going to do? Literally, we think people drained out in 15 years, 20 years, never to return again. You know, if you hunt in one place for your lifetime, and you go to a new place, you're lost. You learn that spot, you know those nick points, you know where the deer are going to move. And once you move out, you can never go home again. And that's what seems to have happened. The area is largely abandoned. And then about between 1150 and 1250, uh, people that we call Oneota move into the area. The area is kind of rejuvenated to some, th some degree, but these people don't hunt in the interior. Nobody hunts, nobody lives in the interior again to any extent. Hunt a little bit there, but they don't live there. Now they are on the river, now they're growing corn, and now they're hunting bison in the west. Uh, at the same time that all this is happening, the great site of Cahokia in our East St. Louis, Illinois, is developing and spreading out. And your town just down river, Trempeleau, Wisconsin, has a colony of people who came from here and moved right there. Up above the motel on the top, colleagues been working up there for a few years. Very important site of these people coming in. And what exactly they're doing, we're not sure proselytizing, hunting, looking for game. It's, it's a long story that we won't do tonight. And these people are, again, I said, hunting bison in the West, growing corn now, enriched field agricultural systems, unlike anything before. And this is just the very end of prehistory. This is A.D. 1350 to 1600 in this part of the world. Pretty late for the most part. And the sun sets on the cultures after about uh, 1600, uh, we have some native folks here, and certainly these are the same people that come up. The Ho-Chunk are more in the east and come over. Iowa, or a few Iowa here, uh, were probably related to these last people. Uh, but the river really becomes very, uh, uh, very few people. DeSoto goes through the southeast, Hernando DeSoto goes through the southeast in the 1550s. And between 1550 and 1600, nine out of every 10 Indian villages from Arkansas all the way from across Wisconsin disappear. And we think it's because of European diseases spreading from the DeSoto expedition. Hill Prairies, going home. Uh, this is what we call the Cade Mound. It's about 55 or so acres. We have 48 of those acres, a couple corners we don't have. And uh, this is an 03, this is an 06. This is our hill prairie here. There's almost nothing there. You can see where we've cleared this here. And now we've cleared a lot of this out and we're working back this way. And I was too lazy to get up and too busy to get up there and get a photo this past week so I can show you what it looks like today. But this is the area that we're reconstructing. This is right where we've been doing the excavations down around here. So this is, this is home for me and Suzanne and uh, this we've done, uh, we've done a lot of pine removal. The gentleman I got this property from, we got this property from. I said, did you ever burn it? He said, oh, no, I never burned it. Got there in 1940, got this part in 03. It had never been burned. So it was covered in cedar and prickly ash and ironwood. And uh, first big year on the mound, I burned 18 brush piles that next, next, next year. So 18 brush piles. And uh, uh, we now have a very nice uh, 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 prairie coming in. Uh, this is our oak savanna part. And this is p a p another part that we just had cleared. 
Uh, now I have the Amish do a lot of the chainsaw work since I almost had a tree dropped on me. I thought maybe I'd let somebody more experienced work on it. And uh, you can see uh, it, the, the result in part to uh, beautiful prairie plants. One of the bur oaks up here I cored in 03. I took a dendro core. I had 185 rings. So this is pretty much undisturbed. And we're, we're just reclaiming it. We're not restoring it. We don't bring in any seed. We're just restoring it. And that guy, I don't know who that Armin Bartz guy is, but he helped us do this. <laughs> and everybody knows Armin. And, uh, and uh, I want to mention the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. We have this in the easement with them, if I didn't already say that. And uh, we, we very much appreciate their efforts. Uh, this is a, a view of the lower part, old field, bad shape. Prairies coming back in, in the areas. Here's the top part. These pines are slated to go out this year or next year. We get the Amish to take them out when the ground's frozen. But uh, my neighbor, because there was no, no vegetation up there, they planted 1,100 pines on there. Because they got the seeds, they got the little plants for free because it was bald. And they wanted trees. And then I went in the board, cut them down. Only about 150 took, fortunately. Uh, uh, this is why they, uh, John Curtis and others call these topographically controlled hill prairies or go prairies. This is how steep it is, but these are the pines we're going to take out. And this was all overgrown, but this is all very nice now. And we burn this every other year or parts of it every other year. And we have thousands of past flowers. We have, uh, this is I think a round stem foxglove. Uh, Abby Church from the Conservancy had a seed section so she could be sure. But that just popped up in the last couple or three years. We have two species of foxglove. Uh, of course, butterfly milkweed, lead plant. You can't see here, but there's uh, pocoons and birdfoot violets by the thousands. And they're all there. They just need to be opened up and given life again. And uh, Great Plains Ladies Trusses, you can smell them before you see them. Smell like uh, uh, almonds. Uh, beautiful, I don't know if you can see them here. Beautiful plants just showed up. And our pollinators, we love our pollinators. Yeah, and we, we, you know, I, I try to tell people, you know, you have to, just can't kill everything and just grow corn. I try to tell my local board, I said, you know, we need pollinators, we need plants uh, for pollinators, so we have a variety of things, hummingbird moss, and don't look at that, just look at that. But, but our native plant, mostly our native plants. We also love our herps. We protect our herps. Uh, prairie ringneck snake, we have a very nice population of prairie ringneck snake. I actually turned over rocks two years ago. I, I couldn't count them all. There were around 20 under one rock. But this year I had very low numbers that I, that I found, so I don't know what that's about. Prairie ringnecks, we have brown snakes. How do you make them do that? Uh, a little decayed brown snake, red belly snakes in our wood edges, and of course milk snakes, which I don't like because they will eat these other two snakes. So these go to the local quarry whenever I find them. <laughs> the quarry guy said he never saw so many snakes. So, and we also along our creek, uh, we have uh, we have a population of wood turtles. We're very proud of, and we have we we've turned up a couple of Blandings turtles in the last two years. And this is a little baby snapper that our dog found and he wanted to contribute, so. Well, other treasures on the edges of this hill. It's an amazing hill. If I, I wish I had another picture of it there. But it's this isolated hill, isolated by the creek. And uh, on, the, on, the, on some faces we have American ginseng here. And don't ask me where these are. You can't come and look. And early spring morels. But we also have one of the largest colonies of a Pleistocene snail, cherry pitstone. Hendersonia occulta is what it is. Uh, and, and, but this is one here. We have, we have a colony with maybe several thousand. And it's on that northeast corner of that mound. So you got the south face. You got prairie from the mid-Holocene during the ultrathermal. You know, on the north face, you got stuff left from the Pleistocene. Think about that. Think about that diversity right here. You have animals that still relate to that. Hello. The end. That is the end. <laughs> well, there's anything after this. <laughs>